it, it didn't lend for the romance that that scene needed. And it was supposed to be at sunset with wine and very romantic and seductive. And it's just too cold, you know, you can't do it like this. That's not sexy. The forecast we got today was very bad. Yeah. So we called the guy in the American air base over there, Rota, and he said, what's wrong with your website? I keep saying it's thunderstorms and it's rain. And he said, no, he said, it's going to be a beautiful day today and tomorrow. It'd be great to do it here if we could, because otherwise, it, with your stop date, it makes it very difficult back in the studios. I we'll have to rebuild the set. Good. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Things have looked up. All day we've had the sun, so uh, I think we're going to be here tomorrow. I think we'll get uh, Hallie's scene. This is her big scene and her entrance into the movie, so uh, spirits are good. And uh, we'll wake up in the morning and see and hope that uh, all is clear, and I'm sure it will be. In the script right from the beginning, there was the situation which we all, all wanted, I think, which was an homage to the Ursula Andress bikini. But obviously we didn't want exactly the same bikini. And anyway, Hallie is a very different modern kind of, you know, more modern kind of actress. And we've come up with this electric orange, very revealing and sexy bikini and a, a very beautifully crafted diving belt, which fits exactly on the top of her hips at the point where her bikini ends. <laughs> and um, the buckle on the belt, because her character's called Jinx, the stainless steel buckle on the belt is a J. Well, it's my freezing shot of the film, I can tell you that, but uh, this is supposed to um, rival Ursula Andress, and uh, I don't know. I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> There's been a great deal of anticipation, <laughs> hot anticipation, and uh, no wonder. I think she's got the most, the most fantastic figure for a bikini that you could ever have. Because Desmond Llewellyn is no longer with us, we wanted to kind of register his absence. There's now the new cue is, is John Cleese, but we wanted him to say a line that just, I never joke about my work, which was the sort of famous line that Desmond Llewellyn said in, in Goldfinger. And we just thought that that was a nice tribute to him. You must be joking. As I learned from my predecessor, Bond, I never joke about my work. Well, it seemed a little strange that Desmond wasn't here, because having played his assistant and having had the most wonderful conversations with him, because he was not just a lovely guy, he told wonderful stories. So many people here who I've met over the years who work with Father, and they all have lovely memories of him, which is tremendous. I think the spirit of Desmond is in every Bond movie and will always be there. Desmond Llewellyn created this character of Q so many years ago. He was always one of the highlights of every Bond film. Well, it was quite interesting because my father, of course, wasn't really sort of successful until the last few Bonds. I mean, he was there, but it was always just a part that came bit by bit. So though we grew up with it, it didn't become the sort of huge, phenomenal world until quite late on. But it was always tremendous fun. Everybody loves uh, the Q scenes. Everybody uh, wants to see what gadgets Bond's going to get and what uh, Q might be up to. When we wrote that new scene, I was very concerned that we didn't just have uh, John Cleese take over and be Desmond Llewellyn. When he appeared in uh, the last movie, he was almost like an assistant. But I thought it was definitely time to kind of move him forward. So we decided to make him Q, not R. We needed to give him a costume, an attitude, a character all of his own. You might mention he's 007, but a perfect marksman isn't really supposed to shoot his own boss. 
was an opportunity to sort of play a scene between Bond and the new Q that explained to people in a subtle way what Q stands for, which is quartermasters. Give me the old firing range any day, quartermaster. And so hopefully that scene sort of marks the passing of Desmond, shows Bond not wanting to call him Q at the beginning and then awarding him the kind of endearment of Q. Just took a few seconds, Q. Wish I could make you vanish. Basically, he has not to like Bond, or else the scenes aren't any fun. So, this is where they keep the old relics, then, eh? Well, have you know, this is where our most cutting-edge technology is developed. Q's attitude is, don't damage the gadgets. And if it means you're going to get killed, well, preferably don't damage the gadgets anyway, you know. And that's what it's all about. And he sees Bond as this, this playboy who is irresponsible and not acting his age. And that's what it's always going to be about. Ultra-high-frequency, single-digit sonic agitator. The funny thing about learning gobbledygook is that some bits of it you get very easily. And then there will just be one phrase, like, I couldn't get target seeking shotguns. Plus all the usual refinements, subject to see torpedoes, uh, target seeking shotguns, uh, oh sorry. Whereas the quite difficult bit about uh, tiny cameras on all sides. Project the image they see onto a light emitting polymer skin on the opposite side. And that was quite simple. Aston Martin call it the vanquish, we call it the vanish. <laughs> This Aston Martin Vanquish is just beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. I have the book and I've looked at how they built it. And I've realised for people who are aficionados of cars or technical stuff, they must love it because it's as imaginary as it can get. I despise technology in all its forms. It's exactly like Desmond and, in fact, exactly like Pierce. I can make very, very few things work. Is that flash all right? That's OK. We can't see it, John. Okay, all right. All right. I've had trouble with ordinary pencils sometimes, and I'm not even talking about propelling pencils. So uh, I'm really extremely badly qualified to play this role, but I got it anyway. I wanted to, for it being the 20th Bond movie and the 40th anniversary and all that, I wanted to bring back all the old gadgets from the old movies, so we hustled up as many as we could find. Alligators from here, and we've got the briefcase and Rosa Clibb's shoe, and we've got the jetpack from Thunderball. We've got dragged them all out. The aficionados might spot them all. We thought we'd give a uh, pathos and a touch of uh, history. Given that there are, there's no other films that have been going this long, it would be a bit miserable not to sort of just sort of have some fun with that legacy. Now, a new watch. Um, this will be your 20th, I believe. How time flies. We thought that for this one it would be nice to get back to a bit more of the glamour and uh, scale of some of the older Bond movies. And there are elements that you'd only get in a Bond movie that you wouldn't get in Die Hard and normal action movies. You know, this place was just built entirely for this one night. The world of Bond should have this, this kind of otherworldly, larger than life aspect to it, so it's something that doesn't exist in the real world. Barbara Broccoli had uh, seen in a magazine about this ice hotel that gets built every year in Sweden, and that seemed like a fantastic visual feast. We got excited about it, and of course the first thing we did was call Peter Lamont. <laughs> and he went up and stayed there. <laughs> and he stayed overnight there, you know, give... <laughs> If you have a challenge, give it to Peter Lamont. I went to see the Ice Hotel, and it's, you know, uh, because it's um, frozen snow, it, you can't build it that big. You, we have to have structure. We went to a whole number trying to achieve this icy look, so now you've seen it. Now we've got this blue on top, then the fellas come round with 
Um, it's like a transparent sugar glass. It's a kind of a plastic, so they kind of spoon it on and you get these kind of icicles hanging down. Then other fellas come around with a stirrup pump, which you believe, with handle wax. This is a part we've already used, and then you see we've also used glitter on it just to kind of get that, that twinkle. It holds a great fascination for me. Men who create images like Peter Lamont, men who dream dreams, and then they grow with sticks and nails. I looked at the plans, I saw the drawings for the Ice Palace. I would visit the set and watch this thing being put together and watch the, the concrete pilings go down 30 feet, watch the steel girders go in, being bolted, being welded. And knowing then that you are going to work on the set, you are going to be performing, this is your stage, that is the joy of doing Bond. Vodka martini, plenty of ice, you can spare it. James, here for the penguins this time, or for the view again? It was massive. I'd never been on a set that large before, ever. Um, and my next question was, does this place really exist somewhere? I want you to look out this way and then you can see ah, that in the air. <laughs> beautiful Iceland, yes. Absolutely. The script initially had us, um, uh, uh, had us turning up in Iceland to an ice palace uh, built by a uh, villain. And then that was pretty much it. There was a car chase, I remember, being in there, but it was always somewhere. It drove around over volcanoes and geysers or something like that. We'd written it and there was the ice palace. but. Lee rightly pointed out, well, you've got this fantastic ice palace, but you only have a couple of dialogue scenes in there. And so he said, let's sink the ice palace and have a car chase inside it. Suppose and we had a car chase in there. Well, everything's possible, you know, they meant put it in structural steel. So of course we went back to the drawing board and then had to add all that steel work in and in some points we had already constructed half the set and we then had to cut into the set a new steel frame just to run the cars on it. We've shot our first, um, the opening scene, which is it's in its pristine state. Now we're going to where the ice palace is starting to melt and Bond is now in the car chase, chasing the baddie. We're gonna have a car chase in here. Bond and I face off again. In the roof of the um, ice palace, we've got water pipes there that are going to send down cascades of water, somewhere in the region of 27,000 gallons a minute. And the problem we've got then is it's going to collect in the centre of the floor there and it's not going to be able to get off the set. So what we're doing now is cutting um, channels to, to allow the water to drop into the water tank, which is below. We've got hundreds of things that are going to collapse and break. They'd be racing around on the upper floors. There's missiles, there'd be parts of walls exploding. The car will be running into parts of the wall and that will be collapsing. just never let you down. It was, it was like going to work in a big theme park or something. 
I think it's fantastic that that is in the 007 stage, which is just such a kind of iconic building. I think it's so fantastic that that still looms large on the horizon of Pinewood Studios, and it's what Kobe created to fulfill his, his dream for something bigger and better than had ever been seen. We did find this one uh, uh, ice lagoon, which is very famous, known as, I think it's a Yerkel Skarlond, which basically means a lake full of icebergs. And they get trapped in this lake because they can't get out because there's a very narrow body of water that takes them out to sea. I sat there and looked at this and thought, well, we better stage the ice palace here because this will look fantastic. And then I thought, what happens when this freezes over? And the guy said, well, it freezes over, all the icebergs stay frozen, solid, locked in place. I thought, well, this is spectacular. What if we put cars on here and have an ice uh, car chase on ice? I know we've seen cars on ice before, but never like this. Not amongst icebergs, giant ones, 40, 50 feet high, sometimes several hundred yards across, tunnels of ice, quite astonishing. And uh, the guy said, well, no one's ever done it, but uh, you can put vehicles on it if it freezes over. So the most hair-raising aspect of the whole procedure, once we've decided to go that way, was Iceland sits in a Gulf Stream, and often the ice doesn't freeze up solid enough to put the vehicles on. We've had some trouble with Iceland uh, when we went there uh, before Christmas. It was freezing nicely. But over Christmas, we had a thaw. Very warm, rainy weather came in. So uh, Iceland's thawed out. It's maybe one of the few years where uh, the lagoon does not freeze. We're looking at alternatives. We've been up to um, some places in Scandinavia. We might also go to Alaska. That's another possibility. Alaska's not confirmed at this time because it's expensive and we don't have officially have the permit and we don't have work permits for the crew. Hi, yeah, Kenny? Because of the time pressure, whether we go to Alaska or Iceland, we are now going to have to okay, fly no, the no, equipment no, wherever no. we go. We can't take okay. any anything by no. ship at the moment. No, Iceland is not cancelled, but currently the ice is not thick enough. And the chances are, although it's freezing, it's possibly eight or nine inches thick, but we need 24 inches. And the chances of that happening in the next week or two is unlikely. We're keeping our fingers crossed. The option of going to Alaska is obviously going full steam ahead as if we are going to go to Alaska. But nothing has been decided yet. Uh, I think the middle of next week will be the cut-off time when we have to make that decision. Normally the setup time for something like this to set this up would take, uh, I would normally want six weeks and even that, that is a short period of time. But because we changed course, went to Alaska and then came back, I was only left with two weeks so it was a bit of a scramble to get this ready. You know we had trucks and things to bring over and on the trip over we lost the wardrobe bus, sort of something like 18 tonnes worth of wardrobe, wardrobe bus got blown off the road. You know, we have gusting winds up to 180 miles an hour, snowstorm. The main concern for the crew when they got here was um, the safety on the ice because ice is very unpredictable and uh, we have to ensure that the, the crew feels safe. 200 people is a lot of weight and of course all the gear as well, so our, our biggest issue is making sure we're spread out, that we don't have everybody bunched together in one place, and so therefore putting too much pressure on the ice in one particular area. What they feel is that if the ice does break it will put a wheel through or 
it'll half go through. It won't just disappear you know, from, from view that quickly. All the cars have got flotation bags, which the driver hopefully will pull before he leaves. That will make the car buoyant. It, it'll still be submerged, but it allows us to recover the vehicle. We have to test it. So whenever we have a location given to us, we, we try and get ahead of everybody else, drill some holes. So for example, this morning they wanted to put a camera position near to an iceberg. We send somebody in, they drill a test hole to find out that the ice is thick enough. As long as it's within our, within our parameters, we're happy for people to work there. And then we do a check around the area to make sure that that particular iceberg doesn't look like it's going to do anything strange and that there's nothing going to fall off it that's obviously going to happen. Once we've cleared that, then the film crews can move in and use that area. Well, the required thickness varies with temperature, you see. So um, at the moment, 30 centimetres is well safe. If it got warmer, it might change, though. Perfect day for filming. In our heated workshop, we're uh, barely above freezing. Um, as you saw, the icicles are still frozen on the cars. Out there, we're getting wind chills of about minus 22 to 25. You really can't show any skin at all. You've got to cover up and grin and bear it. We've had batteries freezing. That's the first thing. The batteries just don't like it. We have to try and keep them warm. We've had um, the gearboxes first thing in the morning when they're really cold after a night at minus 15 or whatever it is up here. It's very sluggish to get warm. When there is snow on the ice, it's getting, it accumulates around axles and things and the cars start getting sluggish. We have to bring them in, thaw out all of the ice around the axles and drive shafts. Brakes freeze on, tyres freeze to the floor. <laughs> yeah, it's a whole new experience. We've been out on the ice testing, uh, highly successful, I have to say. Too much grip on the Aston, believe it or not. It drove just like it was on tarmac. The spike tyres that we had made by Yokohama, unbelievable, and just like driving a car on normal road. So we've actually had to have normal tyres studied to give less grip to allow the guys to work the car. 